We've never been ones for the spotlight, not ones for fanfare or praise. We're driven by purpose, a calling higher than our own, a purpose we've fought for, a purpose we've bled for, a purpose we've proved. Our story is about resilience. It's about determination and it's about strength. For over 70 years, in disaster and in peace, in tragedies and in triumph, we've led the way. It's who we are. We are first in and last out. We're warriors, we're airmen, we're civil engineers. This is our story. Our story begins long before our name. It was the 1940s. We were soldiers, and World War II was about to begin. We started in aviation engineer battalions in the Army Corps of Engineers. Our focus was airfields, and the mission was clear. Construct, conceal, maintain, and when necessary, defend. Across Europe, North Africa, and the Pacific, America and her allies were depending on our civil engineer expertise, and we rose to the challenge. Maintaining and improving existing facilities and pavements, standing ready to respond at a moment's notice to flight line and facility fires, camouflaging airfields, constructing defensive barriers to protect those airfields, and specializing in rapid runway repair. We were warriors who helped America lead the allies to victory. America's triumph in World War II hinged on the success of air combat power, and our most senior civilian leaders took notice. President Truman proudly signed the United States Air Force into existence with the National Security Act of 1947. We were part of a new branch, a new military frontier. But the ties to our Army past remained intact, and Army engineers were still in charge. They called them SCARWAF, Special Category Army with Air Force. And we relied on them to recruit, organize, train, and equip Air Force combat engineering units. Our leadership was disjointed, and we were not ready for conflict. The cracks in the structure began to show during peacetime. And as we turned back to a wartime footing, those cracks turned into canyons. It was the 1950s. Were we airmen or were we soldiers? All we knew was that we were at war. Korea posed a new challenge. Unfamiliar terrain and a lack of air-based engineering standards exposed the severe consequences of a SCARWAF dependent air force. Our commanders estimated we were only 10 to 15% as efficient as we were during World War II. We were poorly organized, poorly trained, and poorly equipped. We could not properly support the construction of airfields and facilities necessary to project power on the Korean Peninsula, and therefore could not support the flying mission of our United States Air Force. In the two years of war in Korea, nothing hurt America's air combat power more than weak air facilities. Everything about how we operated needed to change, and we didn't have much time. New fights were on the horizon. Change doesn't happen overnight. Despite failures in Korea, we did not capitalize on those hard-earned lessons learned. In the mid-1950s and early 1960s, we found ourselves still reliant on the Army for military troop construction. The pickup game wasn't working, and we needed an Air Force solution. It was an era of fighting for our autonomy, but also an opportunity to define our civil engineer capability. Maybe we couldn't build, but we could repair. 
We called it BRAT, Base Recovery After Attack. It wasn't everything we needed, but it was a step in the right direction. When Congress asked us to consider having only civilian engineers in peacetime, our founding fathers knew this was our moment to fight for the organization we needed. With clear vision and steady hand, Brigadier General Tom Meredith, then Colonel Meredith, assembled a team to conduct a capabilities-based civil engineer manpower study. And the results proved what we'd always known. We needed active duty engineers ready and able to deploy into conflict anywhere in the world. And we needed civilian engineers who could hold our strength at home. Prime Beef was our answer. Base Engineer Emergency Force. Airmen engineers who could deploy at a moment's notice, who were organized, trained, equipped, and ready for warfare. And our answer came at the right time. The United States was again at war, safeguarding democratic freedoms and values abroad. The eyes of the world were on Vietnam, and the conflict was escalating. In 1965, the Secretary of Defense was knocking on our door. The Marines were rapidly constructing airfields. Could the Air Force do the same? And thus, Red Horse was born. Rapid Engineer Deployable Heavy Operational Repair Squadron Engineer. An Air Force heavy construction capability not reliant on the Army. It was our time to shine. It was the 1960s. We were prime beef. We were Red Horse. We were airmen. We were at war. Our motto, can do, will do. Highly trained teams working together to support air combat power. We proved that airmen engineers, under airmen leaders, could adapt, construct, and protect airfields. Whenever, wherever. The war in Vietnam ended, but a new threat emerged. There was a new urgency now, in the wake of the unexpected... An era of Cold War rivalry. And despite our new strength, the question remained. Were we truly ready? It was time to find out. The Soviets are engaged in the most massive peacetime buildup of military forces. New era, new focus. Readiness was the name of the game, and Cold War tensions were reaching new heights. It was the 1980s, and the geopolitical chess match between America and the Soviet Union meant potential war at any moment. American military bases, both at home and abroad, were targets. We needed to simulate a real war attack. In 1985, at Spangdalem Air Base, Germany, the Air Force put itself to the test. They called it Salty Demo, and it was unlike any exercise we'd done before. It felt real. The damage to the airfield was real, and in the end, we were shorthanded, unprepared, and unable to recover the base after attack. While Salty Demo exposed our failures, it also exposed our gaps. In 1991, we took a step to enhance our capabilities by bringing EOD, Explosive Ordnance Disposal, and readiness into the civil engineer organization to join fire protection in our emergency services. They had always been critical teammates in the airfield damage assessment and emergency preparedness and response. It was time we made it official. Salty Demo proved that the nation depended on our readiness, but we needed to test the civil engineer organization on a wider scale. So we held our first readiness challenge in 1986. We competed against each other to test our strength and gain critical readiness insights, force bed down, equipment operations, airfield damage repair, base recovery after attack. The goal? Prepare us, inspire unity of effort, and show the world that we were ready to fight anytime, anywhere. But not everyone was convinced of our purpose. With the end of the Cold War, the Secretary of Defense dropped the Defense Management Review Decision 967 in 1990, telling the Air Force to make drastic changes, to be more like the Army and Navy. Civilianize all engineering at home and move active duty engineers into the reserves. The Air Force response, no way. Unlike the Army and Navy, the Air Force fights from its bases and needs expert airfield engineers ready at home and abroad. 
The defense of our purpose came from our most senior Air Force leaders. We came out victorious. The 1990s offered constant tests of our readiness, from Operation Desert Storm in Kuwait to Operation Joint Endeavor in Bosnia. We proved the Air Force's resistance to DMRD 967 was worth it. Our structure worked. We were effective and we were ready for the regional conflicts that plagued the decade. But nothing could have prepared the world for what came next. See, it just flashed on my screen. It looks like there is a a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. This we just in, you are looking at a, obviously a very disturbing live shot there. That is the World Trade Center, and we have unconfirmed reports this morning. A plane hijacking before these crashes. Another plane just hit. The wing tower has exploded. We speak as under lockdown, our armed forces are taking all necessary precautions. September 11, 2001. The world as we knew it changed. Our homeland was under attack, the World Trade Center in New York City, the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., a farmer's field near Stony Creek, Pennsylvania. As Americans, we grieved. As United States Air Force civil engineers, we went to work. Firefighters, prime beef, EOD, in all, more than 400 Guard, Reserve, Civilian, and Active Duty Civil Engineer Airmen responded directly to the September 11th attacks. We contributed to rescue efforts, provided equipment stations, and organized, then led, critical engineering and logistical support hubs. We responded rapidly and efficiently, knowing all too well that a post-9-11 world meant war was on the horizon. We immediately mobilized in support of Operation Noble Eagle, the United States Homeland Defense Mission. And by October 2001, our boots were on the ground in Southwest Asia. In 2004, the Army, in need of our expertise in base operating support, began calling on us for in lieu of taskings. But acting as surge support of Army operations limited our efficiency and effectiveness. We needed airmen engineers under the command of an airman engineer. So we broke paradigms and organized for that requirement. We centralized command of our forces and tackled these demanding joint missions our way. The global war on terror, operations enduring freedom and Iraqi freedom, demanded total force involvement. We deployed through hubs like Manus and al -Ud to get to where our joint brothers and sisters and our coalition partners needed us. We forward deployed to main operating bases like Kandahar, Bagram, Balad, Tikrit, Kirkuk, and Camp Victory. From those mobs, we moved to austere forward operating bases like Fob Hammer, Q West, Shindad, Fob Dwyer, Fob Rhino, Fob Warhorse, and Fob Shank. Where only desert existed, we built bases. Where runways and facilities were destroyed or damaged, we repaired them. When local allies needed new governance capabilities, military academies, courthouses, schools, water and wastewater facilities, we helped them construct. We served as advisors and instructors to build their capabilities and capacity. Both at home and deployed, our souls were all in, pouring our blood, sweat, and tears into the fight. When faced with the evils of combat, our Air Force EOD teams demonstrated incredible courage and competence with many sacrificing everything for our brothers and sisters in arms, for our country, for the global ideal of freedom for all. The first two decades of the 21st century brought new challenges, new tragedies, and new triumphs. And as we look to the future, more change is upon us, an era of great power competition, defined by rapid technological innovation and peer competition, an era which requires full spectrum readiness to ultimately decide victory or defeat. But if our history has taught us anything, it's that even in the face of uncertainty, if we stay true to our principles and values, we are unstoppable. Regardless of where the next conflict occurs or who we face, the Air Force will be at the forefront. And we, America's airmen engineers, 
who have pledged an oath to something bigger than ourselves will be ready always 